Today, we're actually going to be kicking off a new teaching series called The Genius of Jesus, where we're looking at his most famous teaching, uh, particularly that, uh, that very recognizable set of teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. We've, for a couple of thousand years, philosophers have looked into it, theologians have tried to understand it, even non-Christians have come to it and said, well, maybe it's about something, you know, totally and fundamentally different than what we all expected, and, um, and so I'm looking forward to jumping in with that, that with you. Uh, before we do that, just a, a quick announcement. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do as our church has grown numerically is to deepen uh, our relational capacity, and so we're coming off a teaching series where we just looked at Sabbath, like for seven weeks, and, and I have exhausted fully everything I know to say to you about Sabbath, which is why we didn't keep going. So you're like, are we done Sabbathing for the summer now? No, you can keep going. I just, I'm all out of things to say. Uh, so if you would like more on Sabbath, just go back to the beginning of the series. Um, and, but what we're, what we're attempting to do is, is recognizing the fact that God has called this church to make disciples how are we going to do that well as we grow larger? And so we are, we're, this is something we're thinking about all the time in our office and I'm praying about all the time with the elders, but one of the things that we realized we could do a while ago is we could leverage technology to help you do that. And so, um, so today, live on the App Store is our church app. Now let me tell you why we're not doing this, okay? Because for a long time I didn't want to do this. Because I just, I didn't think you needed a glorified media player, frankly. Um, and, and this took a lot of work, and I was like, ah, well, you know, they can go to YouTube, it's fine. Um, but the reason that we're doing this is because I became convinced that this can actually help you follow Jesus and fish for men. It can actually help us bring the truth and the grace and the changing power of the gospel for the glory of God and the good of all people. And so there's, there's a tons, of, tons of stuff on it. Yes, you can absolutely download you know, sermons and watch them and all that stuff, but there's a whole lot more to it, particularly the second button, which I want to show you in this really terrible graphic um, that I, I made. Uh, and I didn't save it at a high enough resolution. So once again, the art department of this church has failed you. Um, I'm the art department. Okay. Um, but this particular tab, if you, if you download it, you'll notice the second button says rhythms. We, we talk a lot in this church about how discipleship really is a rhythm of following Jesus and fishing for men. And if you forget one to the you know, expense of the other, then you'll, you'll only get it half right. And so we have actually tried to take all the tools that we use to teach you the grace or teach you the truths of the gospel, to uh, share with you the grace of the gospel and help you change by the power of the gospel and, and put it here available to you. We, we say this a lot. A disciple is someone who can study and share the truth, who can uh, grow in grace as they show it, and someone who's being changed by Jesus and helping someone else change. That's not new. We've been saying that for years. Now I think we figured out a way to have a piece of technology to help you do that. And so uh, if you're you know, interested in what, what is Christianity all about, you can access our one-to-one -one book right there. It's an, that's also an app that you can download. Yeah, Life and Doctrine, all of our lectures for Life and Doctrine are now available through this. Um, you can download the book. You can sign up for the next course if you want to. It's all right there. Um, you can also download the Bible app, Purple Book stuff. Un under the Grace tab, uh, there's a way to connect to our groups. If you need prayer, like if you're in a moment where you're like, man, I need my pastors praying for me right now, we, we will actually get that immediately. Um, so you can click, uh, pray for me. I have, an, I have a need, and it'll pop up uh, to us, and we can see it and respond actually way better than if you just, you know, called into the office. And finally, change. You can sign up for our next water baptism. You can get on a team. There's just a ton of stuff on this thing. So we want you to take advantage of it. So uh, if you will, download it. Um, it costs no money. Uh, and, and we really believe it's going to help you. Um, so there you go. Plug over. Um, but I, I suppose I should finish with a, a quote from that great prophet of American enterprise, Steve Jobs. There is an app for that. Okay. Um, now, back to the text. Uh, join me in the book of Matthew. The fifth chapter, we're going to read the first 12 verses, pray, and get to work. Matthew 5, starting in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain where he sat down, and his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall become called sons of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Will you pray with me? Father, please send the Holy Spirit like you promised you would every time the word of God is opened. Would you send the Spirit to illuminate it, to help me preach well? Lord, let, let just keep interesting data transfer away. That we don't just want to do that. We, we want to be transformed. We really do believe, God, that when we study the truth and the grace of God is with us, we are changed. So would you help us today? Do some divine act in our time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the Sermon on the Mount, as I've mentioned, is like the most famous of Jesus' teachings. I mean, even uh, whole chunks of non-Christians have heard of the Sermon on the Mount, um, and whether you know it or not, and whether you like it or not, pretty much all of the Western canon of law and literature has in some way been shaped by the ethics derived from the Sermon on the Mount. So it, it, it's at least interesting, and hopefully a whole lot more than just interesting, to study what Jesus was doing in the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know if you've, you know, maybe you've been following Christ for a long time, or you're just checking out Christianity or wherever you happen to be in between those two, but we probably all share a pretty shallow understanding of what's going on here. I mean, even up to the point where I began studying this, I just assumed that these were like interesting ethical injunctions, like if you wanted to be like a black belt ninja Christian, you know what I mean, right? Like, hey, Jesus died for your sins, repent and believe the gospel, like that's like the base level, but advanced placement Christianity, Christianity 2.0, like with the extra little thing on your graduation cap or whatever, is this stuff, right? So that this is what you want to do. And, um, and the, the first service found that joke funnier. Um, I'll uh, note that you are fuddy-duddies. Okay. Um, <laughs> so... That's not what it is. It's something more than just uh, the to-do list of Christianity, but there is some, some great ethical stuff going on here. But it's not as though Jesus just showed up and started talking. It, I, it, it's important that you read your Bible. It's important that you read the Gospels. But it's important that you read actually the whole thing because what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is not just kind of falling out of heaven, giving us some interesting kind of ethics, and then like piecing out back to God. Like that's not what he's doing. Matthew particularly is, uh, is really interested in helping us understand that Jesus is actually the continuation of the whole Old Testament story. So that Matthew, commentators have noted this for a long time, seems to be peculiarly written to a Jewish audience quite steeped and familiar with Old Testament religion, which is why it starts with a genealogy, not the way we start conversations. But it's really helpful if you want to connect the main character of your gospel to Adam, Abraham, and Moses, right? And so that's what Matthew does, and, and we don't have time for me to get all geeky with you and tell you all the neat connections um, and the ways that Matthew does this. But particularly, Jesus, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount and the way Matthew describes it, wants it to fire off some like memories in your mind if you're steeped in Old Testament religion, because there's... There's Jesus. I just want you to remember what we just read. Jesus is with a big crowd. He goes up a mountain, gets a law, right? Gets some, some ideas from God and tells them to the people. And if you're like even vaguely familiar with the Old Testament, that should sound like somebody, a really famous somebody, somebody named Moses. And so in the book of Matthew, when Matthew unpacks the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he's very obviously placing Jesus in the footsteps of Moses as if to say a greater version of Moses is now among us. A truer lawgiver, a better prophet, someone is coming and taking everything Moses did and walking in Moses' steps and, and as it were taking everything to like version 2.0, right? Like upgrading the whole thing. And it's in, it's in that light that we really need to hear what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount because this stuff is not new. It's not new. We Christians, especially in America, can be very guilty of like just ignoring the first three-fourths of our Bible, kind of getting the gospel story and then kind of going only with that. And, and we, don't, we don't need to do that. God is very wise in giving us the Old Testament and, and helping us understand that we are part of this huge story of God rescuing and redeeming a people and creating on the earth a people that look like him. And that's precisely the point. Because when Jesus comes and begins to unpack for us in the Sermon on the Mount what we're to look like, 
we see that he's giving us some radically inverted ethics from what we're used to. That, that in Christ's kingdom, the ethics seem to be just flipped upside down from the kingdom of this world. Now, now in order for you to get this, I have to, I have to give you this mental picture. You, do you all know what a Venn diagram is? I love me a good Venn diagram. Okay, so picture in your mind, as it were, from, the, the, you know, from Adam to the birth of Christ, that's one circle, right? And then from uh, Christ to the returning you know, kingdom of God, that's another circle. What's going on right now in, in Christ's ministry and until he returns, and we're caught in this part, is, as it were, the overlap with one border being the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the other border being when he returns and, and you know, makes the world new again, Right? And so we're caught in what a lot of pastors and theologians have called the already but the not yet of Christ's kingdom, right? We're in the weird spot in history when that overlap is happening. And if that's true, then that means we who are his people should reflect the coming kingdom, not the dying one, right? That is why he is so interested in giving us the inverted ethics of himself, of Jesus and his kingdom. And that's exactly what we read here. Now, another thing about reading rules, because some of you are going to say, well, but we're, we're Christians. We don't have rules. And to you, I want to slap, uh, but I won't. Um, I won't. I won't, because it's not a nice thing to do, so saith the Sermon on the Mount. However, uh, we should note that, uh, that, no, it's not as though, you know, you get born again and you pray this prayer that acts like some little incantation of sympathetic magic over your life, once said, getting God and a divine kind of half Nelson, and now you can go and flit about and do whatever you want. We live that way, and, and much of uh, shallow Western uh, so-called Christianity might have given that to us, because there's a lot of money to be made with people from, for people like me with face mics uh, to hawk that garbage to you. Uh, the only problem is uh, it won't save you or be good news to you. Jesus saves us, but have you ever stopped to ask, unto what? Like, why? How should that make us any different? Like, great, as if, as if being a Christian were some, sign of, some sort of really great, like, fire insurance. Right, I've got God, so now I'm good. Like, I sleep better at night because I have homeowner's insurance, knowing that, like, if it burns down, it's cool going to build it again. But like, that's not how the gospel is meant to work. It's not make, meant to make you go like, oh, no, we're good. Me and God, we're good. We're good. We're good. Are you good? John Stott wrote a great book on the Sermon on the Mountain, and in it he says this, with Jesus, this new age had dawned, and the rule of God has broken into history. Repent, he cried, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Indeed, he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount, then, is to be seen in this context. It portrays the repentance, the metanoia, the complete change of mind, and righteousness, which belong to the kingdom. Many of us, we, we get the whole like repentance, faith going under the water. We had a big baptism last week, and everyone's crying and clapping and singing, and it was awesome. But like, now what? Well, there's a righteousness into which we are to walk. That is, it describes what human life is and human community look like when they come under the gracious rule of God. There is no single paragraph in the Sermon on the Mount in which this contrast between the Christian and non-Christian standards is not drawn. That's the, those two overlapping circles, as it were. And so what we want to ask ourselves this morning is, what are the inverted ethics of Christ and his kingdom, and do I live them out? And if I don't, how should I? And what, what should our community be shaped into? What should this spiritual family feel like and look like and think like and act like? And it'll look a lot like the inverted ethics of Christ and his kingdom. Now, just so you know, these are not like eight optional add-ons, okay? This is not the Chipotle of religion where you go, ooh, I'll have that. Ooh, none of that, that, that self-denial, no thank you, but plenty of money, yes? And, uh, right, and guac, because you always get guac. Um, <laughs> like, this is not... Their guacamole is really good if it, you know, doesn't give you uh, E. coli or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, so these are not like optional add-ons to the burrito of your walk with Jesus, yeah? This is a fully or description of the way our ethics should be shaped by Christ and his kingdom, and they are super different, as we're about to see, than, than the ethics of this world. One final note before we jump in. Law can feel like bad news. If I give you 25 things to do and you're only doing three of them, that's a failing grade, right? 
or if you're kind of doing all of them but not to like good standards, also failing, yes? So the Puritans had this really great phrase. They would say the law sends us to Christ to be justified, but Christ sends us back to the law to be sanctified. Do you see the... So the law, we look at the law and we're like, oh, no, (laughs) I'm not doing any of this. Or you go, I'm good, I'm doing all of it, in which case you're proud, which is the worst of all. (laughs) And so it, 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 it highlights we really need Jesus. Yeah, it's supposed to do that. But then Christians, having received Christ and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, he sends us to the law to go, okay, this is kind of the ethical shape that my people are supposed to take. So let's see the shape of Christ's inverted ethics. The first inversion that he gives us is this spiritual poverty, which is to mark all of us. The scriptures say here in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in the, in the Luke account of the beatitude, these are called the beatitudes, the blesseds, okay, because the Latin word for blessed is beata, and it just stuck. I don't know why, um, but there you go. Now you know. So, the, the first beatitude, the blessed are the poor in spirit, in Luke says blessed are the poor. And so we could think, oh, oh, he's talking about like financial poverty. That is almost certainly what he is not talking about. He's not saying blessed are you when you have no money. Uh, there is, uh, Christ may call you to be uh, rich or poor or both at different times in your life. There, there's not a, a spiritual plus or minus to either one of those. There's huge dangers with both, particularly with wealth. But that's not what we're talking about here. Rather, Christian ethics are to be first shaped by our deep sense of spiritual poverty that looks like this. Man, God, without you, I am really lost. Literally, the only requirement for becoming a Christian is first you realizing, I cannot save myself. Or put another way is, I can't buy myself back. I can't redeem myself. I am spiritually too poor to pay the price for my own sin. Do you follow? Which is why this beautiful redemption metaphor, which stretches from, you know, cover to cover in the Bible, is that Jesus is paying a price. He is buying us back. We were slaves to sin, but as it were, Jesus bought us from our former slave master, and now we are owned by him, our righteous and gracious king. Yeah? Knowing that, though, and and experiencing that first requires that you kind of look at your pockets and you're like, I I can't, right? Right? I can't do that. I can't pay for that. I can't afford me. Yeah. Yeah. That, that attitude, that awareness, that emotional response should be something that marks us as an order of first importance and as like one of the very most basic ethics of any Christian. Proud Christian almost doesn't make any sense at all. It's, it's almost up there with married bachelor. Like, you can't be, Right? Yes? Have you seen that really round triangle? No, because you can't have one, right? You just can't. Why? Because humility and, and being utterly decimated by your sin is one of the first awarenesses that we should come to the cross with. That's why the hymn writer wrote, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to thy fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Yeah? Those aren't just pretty words. That's reflecting a very real truth that apart from grace, we are spiritually in utter poverty. And that is a very upside-down kind of ethic from the way the world teaches you to be. You know, you've got to be very self-assured and, and very, no, no, I'm, I'm rich. I, if I just picture myself rich, I'll declare rich. I will hang my first dollar and worship it, worship it, rub it, put my wallet against it. Yeah, right? It's just weird. We, we, come, we come to the cross first recognizing that we are spiritually poor. The second inversion has to do with this heartbreak over sin. Some of us, we come to Christianity and we're quite clinical about it. Like, oh, you've got a case of the sin. Jesus is like this great vaccine, and then we're good. And there's no emotional response at all. No emotional response at all. And that's wrong. You say, well, I'm very unemotional. That's okay. You don't have to be very emotional about it, but there should be an emotional response to your sin. That which rips you apart from God relationally should bother you, right? Like if, if I really hurt, deeply hurt someone I love, 
it makes me sad, right? And I'm assuming, unless you are an actual sociopath, when you do that, it should make you sad as well, right? When you've done something, when you've committed an offense or hurt someone, your emotional response should be the frowny emoji, right? The one with the tear, right? Not just the blank face guy. We should be marked by a heartbreak over our sin. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, wallowing in depression and self-pity. I'm not talking about that. I'm simply saying sin should break our hearts, not even just our own sin, but sin writ large, social sin. Or if you see some, you know someone right now who's doing something that will absolutely destroy their life. How does that make you feel? Well, welcome to the emotional life of God. You say, well, this makes me very sad. I know. Yes. And in the inverted ethics of Christ and his kingdom, sin should cause us an emotional response of, ah, blessed are you who mourn, for you will be comforted. Now, the good news is, in Christ, by receiving Christ, by coming to Jesus, there is comfort for the emotional wounding of sin. But if you don't, there's not. It's just bad news and then death. Like a really, really bad artsy film. You ever watch one of those? Like, I'll never get this three hours back. Yeah. You in film school, don't make that. I'm an artist. What does that mean? I wear black shirts and, in, in, and am in a bad mood frequently. <laughs> I have a music degree. I'm allowed to pick on my team, all right? All right. Heartbreak over sin. Confession. It, it put another way, confession is not the same as contrition. Yeah? There's confession and then there's contrition. We, we come and we must recognize, yes, we're spiritually poor, but also go, and I'm sorry. You ever had someone apologize? You'd be like, look, sorry. Boy, didn't that make you feel great? <laughs> Forgiven and forgotten. Clearly, you're mourning over sin. You will change. No, All right? Heartbreak over sin. Jesus wept. Wept. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept when Lazarus died. The prophets wept over sin. God, we're told, at, after creation, by the sixth chapter, he's looking at what sin has done to his people, and the scriptures say that his heart was broken. He was deeply grieved. Being a Christian is not the invitation to being a stoic, right? Nor an emotional basket case, but like, there should be an emotional response to sin. The third inversion is this, right humility. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Boy, that, if there's just any value in the kingdom of God that is superbly un-American, <laughs> it would be humility, right? So you know, some of you patriots are like, what are you talking about? We're very humble. Look at all of our humble awards. <laughs> we, were, we were voted most humble by, a, by, by us. <laughs> yes, 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 I know. Humility often evades the people with most of the money and most of the power. And at this moment in history, that happens to be this place. Not necessarily guaranteed to be that way forever. But as long as it is us, and right now it is, how do you know? If you own a phone, that's how you know. That's it. Like, but I don't feel very rich. That's okay. You are. People who have no material needs are often most unaware of who they actually are and their deep spiritual needs. This is why Jesus said there's so much danger that comes with wealth because you just don't feel like you need much, right? So you're just completely out of touch with your spiritual poverty because you have no material poverty to keep you in touch with it. So spiritual poverty, heartbreak over sin, and then right humility, meekness, meekness. Uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was pretty much right all of the time, said this, Emphasizing meekness denotes a humble and gentle attitude toward others, which is determined by a true estimate of ourselves. Isn't that interesting? That the inverted ethics of Jesus Christ do not teach you to so pump yourself up and work yourself up and tell yourself how great you are so that you can one day actually begin to believe it and then stumble into something awesome for yourself, okay? It's the opposite of all that. Now, I know your guidance counselor told you you were awesome, right? Because most of you grew up in the age when pop psychology was like, they need self-esteem. We need to give them medals for everything. Interestingly, when our, because my generation was like that too, when we grew up, what did we do? We invented powerful technologies to catalog all of the accomplishments we've never done. It's called Instagram. 
Never has a generation of human beings been so well documented for accomplishing so little. <laughs> it's just... It's, and we're proud. And we're, we're proud of ourselves. And look, I, social media is here to stay, so I mean, you just have to deal with it. But the, it, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to be like a Luddite and throw your phone out. I'm just saying you need to know how dangerous this stuff is and realize that a, a mark of the kingdom of God in us is right humility, knowing, wait, no, I'm not the greatest. I'm not the champ. I'm not the, no, I'm, I am who God says I am. And right humility is living out my identity in front of others, knowing who I am. Not demanding my rights, not demanding my, you know, well, you uh, offended me and I need to, you know, power my way through that. No, no, no. Right humility goes low. And you say, well, how can I do that? I don't know. Jesus figured out a way and he was way more important than you. Right? I mean, the, the man who became God, the one we literally worship, is the one with all the power, privilege, and prestige who willingly willingly was subdued so that he might welcome others into his kingdom. I'll bet he expects his people to live out a similarly inverted ethic. I'll bet he does. Right humility um, is that one, one theologian, Rudolf Steyer, put self-renunciation is the way to world domination. <laughs> you like that? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, here's what meekness isn't, by the way. Uh, it's not self-deprecation or self-hatred. Some of you think you're meek, and, and you're not. You're just proud in the opposite way. You, you, you constantly, you're, you're picking at yourself, and, you're, and what you're really trying to do is, is invoke the, the praise and attention of others, because woe is you, woe is you, woe is you. That's not humility. Meekness is knowing who God has said you are and living and feeling that way. It's a right estimation of yourself. It's neither puffing yourself up nor ripping yourself down. It's feeling, being, acting, thinking, and doing as God says you are. Yeah? Hard. Hard. The fourth inversion looks like this. A desire for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, this is weird because I don't particularly use the word hunger or thirst to describe my desire for Christ and his kingdom. Like some of you right now, I said hunger and thirst, and you're like, yes, I'm hungry and thirsty for food, so like, speed it up. And, and I, I have terrible news for you. This sermon has eight points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't write the Beatitudes. I'm just preaching them. Um, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, in the Bible, righteousness has at least three aspects. And, and before uh, righteousness the Greek word for righteousness, is the same word for justice. Now, in the Old Testament, they're slightly different, but in the New Testament, they tend to concern basically the same ideas, and, and there are three. There, there's three angles on them. One is right standing before God, being declared righteous, no longer guilty, I'm saved. Two is like your personal moral formation, and then three is like social righteousness or social justice. Now, when I use that last phrase, some of you are like, oh, I know that. I'm into that. And, some, and, and it is like, it's like bait on the line of a hook for some of you. Because I could call anything social justice and you'd be there. Right? No, I'm in. Social justice. What are we protesting? Iguanas. <laughs> Iguanas. Right? Just random. Like we, we sign up for things just because they say the phrase social justice on them. And we have to realize that a hunger and thirst for righteousness is only present in us when we want all three of those. Yeah? All three of those. Some of you feel very proud of your hunger for social justice, and it's not a hunger for social justice. It's just your political persuasion, and it costs you nothing. And you feel very profound because you retweet things. I'm in. Yeah, I know. You've sweat a lot for the cause, whatever the cause is. Real concern for righteousness is, is marked by all of these. You will be concerned that you and others have a right standing before God, that you are personally morally formed, and that God's upside down, the inverted ethics of Christ and his kingdom begin to shape the world, right? That, that's what righteousness and a hunger for righteousness is and, and should be marked by. So it should mean that like you want people to know Jesus, that you want to stop being a moral dumpster fire, and you want the world to be a better place, not just one of those. You follow me? 
What some of you think is that, you know, I can, I can really work for justice in the world, and it doesn't matter if I happen to be a complete disaster myself. Well, according to Christ, it does. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do you know why they'll be satisfied? Because there's a kingdom coming wherein there will no longer be any of the slightest shadow of sin or its effects. All of the big social stuff, all of us hate. Racism and classism and sexism and all the other isms which are just under partiality of any kind. All of it will be gone. There will be no more poverty or crying or shame. There will be no more untrustworthiness. There will be no more sin in you. You will be satisfied if you hunger for those things. If you don't hunger for those things, you may be very surprised when they arrive. The fifth inversion, abundant mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The math on this one is pretty simple. God is abundantly merciful. His people should therefore go and be likewise. How many times must I forgive my brother? Six? Seven? Eight? Jesus says, 70 times seven. And you know someone was in there going, one, two, three. <laughs> it's like you're missing the point. You must always forgive your brother. Why? Because I have limitless mercy, and I want my people to be limitlessly merciful. Now, that doesn't mean that you become, a, you know, a, a, a doormat. It doesn't mean that you don't stand up for anything. It doesn't mean that you kowtow, or it's not the kind of the Ned Flandersization of our society. It, it means something more than that. It means that we give mercy. When we refuse to forgive and to extend mercy, we actually elude joy. Do you realize that? That when you hold on to unforgiveness, when you hold on to bitterness, when you hold on to, yeah, but they really, you actually let go of the joy that you are promised if you are merciful. You let go of the mercy that you need so desperately to receive. The scriptures say that measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And that text is not about money. It's about mercy. If you're abundantly merciful, great. You're getting the gospel. If you're not, oh, you might not. Right? You come to God expecting God to have limitless mercy for you, but like you lay on that horn because they didn't go within .002 seconds of the light change. All of Boston, all of Boston, all of Boston does this. Right? Merciful. To forgive and to be forgiven, to show mercy and to receive mercy, these belong indissolubly together. Indissolubly together. The sixth way Christ and his kingdom inverts the ethics of our world is in this simple purity. Now, when I use the word purity, most often we tend to think of things like um, uh, we, we tend to think of things like sexual purity or, or some other kind of purity, and that's almost certainly not the only thing that is going on here. What, what's going on here is something deeper, something bigger. It, it's actually the simplicity of being who you are before God, before everyone else. Do you find yourself ever using the phrase like, ooh, if my kids saw me do this, or if my parents saw, or if my brother, or if my pastor, <gasps> if I saw you do this. <laughs> the degree to which you have different masks which you wear, different personalities that you put on, is the degree to which you don't walk in simple purity. Does that make sense? It's just fundamentally being who you are before God, before others. But when we sin and we hide, when we act in a way that is shameful and we know it and we don't wish anyone to see it, well, that is probably a good indicator that we're not walking in the purity that should mark Christ and his kingdom, but the pure in heart, they shall see God. This is deeply connected to the Old Testament. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may dwell in his holy place? But he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may see your face, the book of Psalms says. So the pure in heart will get to see God. Why? Because impurity, sin, separates us from God. Right? The, Isaiah is very clear about this. The whole text is very clear about this. Sin is what creates that chasm in that napkin drawing that none of you saw about the gospel. And two, never mind. Um, you can see it on the app. See what I did there? Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Purity, undivided heart, those who are totally sincere. Lord, we need to be this way. The seventh way uh, Christ inverts the ethics of this world is with this, we are to be peace-seeking. We are not to be people who are meant to get out starting a fight. Now, that's very hard for someone like me because I'm 
quite aggressive. You look at my personality profile and it's like, you know, the FBI knows about it. That's all I'm saying. Like, it's just pretty, it's pretty aggressive. And, and so, what does it mean to be a peace seeker? Does it mean to be a weakling? No. No, I don't think anyone would ever accuse Jesus Christ of being weak. Not in the deepest sense. But he became weak so that he might strengthen us. You see, Christians are commanded, as much as is possible, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. That's, that's, that's in the Bible. It's in the book of Romans. Yet, there will be fights that need to be had, conflicts that will be unavoidable, not, uh, not here. I'm not talking about military conflict. There will be times when relationship breaks down because we live in a sinful world and not everyone in it has been radically transformed by grace. There are two circles in our Venn diagram, remember? But as much as possible, we are to be those that seek out peace and don't live in bitterness and in conflict and in brokenness with everyone else. That's not to be the way we are to live out our lives. Peace can only come from God. It's a divine work. Now, I preached a whole sermon last Sunday on how we can walk in peace and how Jesus himself is our only hope for peace. And so if you need that, you can download it from the app. Twice, I've done it twice. But the point is this. Peace is something we are meant to seek. And peace, by the way, is not appeasement. Those aren't the same. Some of us think, oh, we're to live at peace with everyone, so we must therefore just lose all of our convictions that other people have a problem with, and then we'll be at peace with everyone. That's not peace. That's appeasement. Peace is deep and profound and long-lasting. Appeasement is shallow and often called political correctness and solves very little. It solves very little. It doesn't actually deal with the problem, the source of conflict and pain in our society, because sin hasn't been dealt with. There's been no forgiveness and repentance. That's the only way to peace. But very often, we want to be at peace with others, and so we just let go of like, oh, well, here, did did things in this offend you? Well, just tear out those pages. I'll just do the in the beginning, and then even so come, and everything else we can have, right? Right? And and that's not peace. That's, That's actually hatred, because in so doing, we're giving away the one thing that will bring about peace in the world. Jesus bought our peace at a very high price, and we would be very foolish to eschew the price that he paid for the sake of our cheap, momentary, light, costless appeasement. Sometimes when we seek peace, we will not get it, which takes us to the last thing. We should be marked by a willingness to suffer. Christ and his kingdom, the inverted ethics of Christ and his kingdom. We are told, avoid suffering at all costs. Make as much money as you can, as fast as you can, for as long as you can, so that you can live as padded of, of life as you can and get the best insurance you can and, and subjugate or you know, leave or deprive anyone else that you need to in order to have for you and yours, even at the expense of they and theirs. But whatever you do, avoid suffering. And that is the gospel of a people who believe that this is the only world there is. But you see, the scriptures say, Blessed are you when others revile you. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven. You see, we're not people who think there's just one circle, but there's two, and we're in the crazy overlap of the dying gasps of this broken world and God's coming kingdom, which will come and renew it, and then the dwelling place of God will be with man, and he will be with us as our God, and we shall be changed for certain, and it is only in the light of that good news, that gospel, that receiving suffering willingly makes any sense at all, because If this life is all there is, then why would I at all deprive myself of it? But if there is a world which is coming, which is immeasurably better than the one in which we find ourselves, then living for that world, even at the cost of part of my life in this one, is a price that makes complete sense. This is why the scriptures say that Jesus endured the cross, despising its shame. Why? For the joy set before him. Because he realized that that was not the end. That was not, you know, he'd close his eyes and fall out of existence. No, he would awaken into a world where the kingdom of God would be advancing. Listen, there will be times that if you truly desire Christ and someone else truly does not, you will come into conflict I'm not talking about violent conflict. I'm I'm just talking about it will cost you a relationship. In other parts of the world, it costs people their lives. How do we deal with that? Christians have always been marked by suffering. Not, not suffering like, you know, the woe is me kind, but the willingness to suffer. I mean, we don't even have time to walk all the way through history about how Christians were very often the ones running into danger 
to serve those who could not help themselves, even when they were their enemies. We must be marked by a countercultural willingness to suffer. And that's not, that doesn't mean retaliation. That doesn't mean sulking. Some of you think suffering, and, and, or I say suffering and you hear sulking. You know, it's very hard. I got passed over for promotion. I'm being persecuted. I've said this before. If persecution doesn't lead to your bleeding, it's not persecution. It's just very dishonoring to the people in the planet who actually walk through it. It doesn't mean grinning and bearing it like a stoic or enjoying it like a weird masochist. We're, you ever been to that church where it's like you're only allowed to say happy things? How are you? Fine. I'm fine. My wife left me and I'm broke and my body is breaking, but I'm fine. Victory, brother. Like, that's not... You ever been to that church? Uh, God, I, well, good. Apparently, you're not in it. Praise the Lord. That's, that's weird. We are... The type... People of faith are those who are able to say, this is very hard, but I have a very good Jesus. Right? And he will either bring healing and restoration and wholeness now or then. But either way, I'm good. Right? It is this inverted ethic of Christ and his kingdom that we are meant to reflect. And it's only possible, as I mentioned, because of the gospel. If this little list of eight kind of character traits has made you really sad, and you're like, I don't, he's supposed to say things that make me happy, and I feel, I feel blue. Well, let me encourage you. That's part of the job of the law. And it's only starting. Wait till we get to the other commandments. You can't do any of them. I can't either. And, and that's the point. Like, if this is the ethical high mark for what it means to, to be a Christian, we can't do that on our own. Yes, I know. That is why Jesus came in the likeness of human flesh and lived the first perfect human life, which actually fulfilled the commands of Scripture, actually lived out the inverted ethic of Christ and his kingdom so that he might kick down hell's gates, opening a way to heaven so that we who follow him by faith might not just be born again to get out of hell free forever, but follow him into his kingdom and be fitted to live as citizens therein because we've been trained in his righteousness in this life. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Yes, we've been saved. Praise God. And that fact alone will give 10,000 eons of eternity praise. But there's more. We are saved unto a thing, namely to live out a different ethic. And we happen to be living in a political cultural moment where there, there's never been a greater opportunity. Wonderful news. It seems very obvious in our present moment in politics that the Christian church in America is not the wholly owned subsidiary of either one of these candidates. If you are confused in that point, you are wrong. What? I thought that it was very obvious. It's not obvious. No, this is an ethical, moral dilemma. Who to vote for? Because if you're confusing one of them for Christ, you have a very weird Christ. <laughs> right? This is an opportunity for us to realize the strangeness of Christianity, the oddity of our ethic, and the opportunity that we are given to live it out. We could syncretize and live just like the world, help no one, and probably condemn ourselves, or, or we could take this opportunity and embrace the inverted ethics of Christ and his kingdom. It will cost us something, but not anything that we weren't going to lose anyway. And what we could gain. Well, that's something you could have never bought in the first place. Some of you, you're Christians in the room, and you're looking at that, and you're going, I don't live that way. Okay, well, come to Christ and repent. That We're going to participate in the sacrament of communion where we literally remember and act out the brokenness of Christ's body and his shed blood. Receive it by faith. Jesus, forgive me. Wash me. I'm sorry. And then walk out some of our discipleship rhythms to live out this new ethic. For some of you, you're not yet followers of Christ, and you're going, that sounds like an awesome kind of world to live in, but I don't live there. Well, come, and let us introduce you to the Christ who has paid every expense for you to be welcomed into his kingdom.